Who was the other one? Who was the first one? Mark, when I was um, in eighth grade, he used to come over. How did it start? It just did. Did he do things to you? Did, did you do things to him? It was both of us. He used to sleep over. We never did anything in the house. So that makes it all right? So if it wasn't in the house, then whatever you were doing, it's okay? If it was a girl, you wouldn't care. If you can't tell me what you were doing, don't tell me what I'm feeling. Eighth grade? No, I would have cared. <sighs> Did Evie know you liked boys? No. The emails being rough. Why do you want that? It's just stuff I think about. Well, did Eric know that? Did he know that it's just stuff? Lily Taylor is here. This is the greatest day ever. Lily, thank you so much for being here. I yeah. told you before, I'm, I'm such a fan. So expect a solid five minutes scattered throughout this interview of what just sounds like ass kissing, but I'm just a big, big fan. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, American Crime, you are, you are so good in this show. It is such a great show, and it is a, it is a miracle that it is on television. It is so quiet. It is so thoughtful. It is so well-paced and dramatic and, 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 Im and important without being self-righteous. What is it like to work on the show and to work with, with John Ridley and to get these scripts and to watch this story unfold almost in the same way that, that we do as viewers? It's, it's amazing. I mean, this is one of the best jobs. And, and what you first said about the show being so great, I mean, it, ABC, I never thought I'd say ABC, very yeah. good, very nice job. Like, I take my hat off. What a risk, you know? Um, and it's paying off, thank God. So maybe other networks will take the risk to do these more complex stories. Well, there's, a, there's an underlying okay. cynicism in, in, in the movie and television industry that, you know, audiences can't handle complex characters and complex stories. And we're, we're finding more and more that, that that's not true. You just have to come, connect them to something integral, right? Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I know it's funny. I was just, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I was just saying how this is the year, you know, they say the denial is broken with climate change. I feel like the denial is broken that we, we, can, we can handle deep stories as human beings. Like that's kind of what we started doing when we created fire, mm -hmm. was telling these stories to help each other, you know? And now it's like, uh, yeah, we, we want to be nourished by yeah. something soulful. Absolutely. I mean, it's a time where, I mean, you could see something like, uh, I shot Andy Warhol uh, being on television somewhere, being a show, being something that people cared about, a story that people cared about telling, rather than maybe when that came out, a 22-minute uh, sitcom with a, <laughs> a laugh track behind it or exactly, something. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, you were on last season. This season is, is different in its approach. Last season was much more uh, about race and crime, and this season is about sexuality and crime and, and identity. Definitely overlapping in, in, in some ways thematically, but did you know anything going into the second season of who you were gonna play, what the, story, what, what the stories were gonna be? I found out, um, I think John must have come maybe a couple of months before and just said, this is what I'm thinking. And you know, originally I had a daughter, it was a girl. And I mean, I've been following all these cases, you know, all of these, this epidemic that's happening, you know, like Steubenville, Steubenville and, yeah. on and on. And I'd been following them. And when he told me about it, I just thought, fantastic. And, you know, I picked up Crack Hours Missoula, which is a fantastic book, um, kind of gets in. He sort of chose Missoula because it's sort of a microcosm of all the stuff that it holds all of it. And um, but then John changed it to a boy, which I thought was even more fantastic. And um, I was just excited because I know what I love about John is, you know, he's so, it's all about truth. You know, even if he sees the makeup person with me over yonder, he'll be like, no makeup. He, he wants honesty. He wants the truth. He knows, he knows how not to become self-righteous or, or preachy, thank God, because then we stop listening, yeah. you know. 
and, he, and, and, and he's got all these huge issues, like I think at least four issues he's juggling, uh, sexuality, class, race, and well, social media sort of, and then um, Writing, sports. directing, show running. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, this job, it, it's one of the best jobs I've ever been on. Because John is such a great collaborator. He expects so much from his crew, from his actors. He cares so much. I just, and I love collaborating. And if, at the end of the day, that's what it's about for me. Because that's what you have is the relationships, you know? I'm curious, how do you, uh, how do you feel about your character. I'm sure you don't want to pass judgments on her in any way whatsoever as the, the actor playing her, but she is a very complex and at times very frustrating person in how she handles her, her, her child's personal life. She seems to be slightly unaware of boundaries while at the same time wanting to protect. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I can pass judgment on my characters. I mean, oh, really? yeah, I can. I mean, I don't have to like them or agree with them. Like, we can agree to disagree. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> make that little pact up front. But um, I have to empathize. I have to understand them, but I don't have to like them or agree. And um, I think that, you know, she didn't listen as well for maybe like episode two, three, four, and a little bit further on. And I think that as parents, um, I think that's always something a parent could do better with is listening. Well, it's a hard thing to do uh, as a parent because if the kid isn't open, if your child isn't opening up to you and you don't know how to listen, you you end up wanting to become the savior to try to bring them back to that place where they would open up and they would listen and you would listen. But a teenager just doesn't really do that, and parents get really obsessed with trying to save their child and bring them back to that new place when they might not need saving. That's a great point. That's the thing is sort of to not just... a parent. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the theory is excellent. I. Yeah. I hope you can put it to use. <laughs> I'm just going to yell the whole time. I'm not going to know what to do. <laughs> it's all theoretical and easy at the moment when I don't have them. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, the thing is, like, the thing is, is that a parent is doing the best they can do, and it's sort of like no blame in a way, and, and hopefully, I do think she's open, and I do think she's going to learn from what she's doing and try to be better. Thank God she has that. Some parents don't even have that openness, which then all bets are off, you know? Yeah, everything gets shut down. Um, going into this season where, I mean, do you guys ever get notes from ABC? How involved is ABC with the show at all? I've asked John this, and he's been like, we, they just like the show. He is not politicking. It's true. I mean, I forgot we were on a network show. It was like, because I've been on network shows, and I don't love it because I, get, I don't like notes from advertisers. You know, and I understand that's how you get your money and stuff, but I'd like to work somewhere else. Do you know? Because well, even when you work on a show like Six Feet Under, I love that show, right? Alan Ball is fantastic. What I will say about that show, which might be my one criticism, is that it, it, at times it felt the need to keep pace with a kind of with with a dramatic soap opera kind of mm. line. Mm. At sometimes, mm. it's still beautifully directed and written. American Crime has found a way to tell these stories without in any way feeling like it's got to sort of create new relationships or a pregnancy or something mm -hmm. that keeps the dramatics very big and, and even melodramatic at a time. Mm -hmm. It's all very subtle somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John has a fantastic barometer of knowing when something's going, when it's coming from a false place or just because you think it should be there. Well, they say you should by episode seven have a... Exactly. And when he and he he has had some things and he's changes them. So he's so flexible. Like he's like, you know what? Why did I put that there? It doesn't need it. I'm taking it out. Wow. It's great. That's a great director who knows their sort of limitations sometimes as as a writer. The uh, the kid who plays your your son in this show. Forgive me, I forget his name. He is unbelievable. Where did they find this kid? Did you do a chemistry read with him at all? Did you have any say in like who they were hiring, or did you guys did you sort of show up to set one day and and this brilliant young actor was there? I, I showed up and he was there. I mean, I think they just knew, as you can see, he's brilliant, and I think they must have seen it in the audition. He's he's from Toronto. I mean, he's been on a, some shows. He's not an unknown, and he was like it was like between him and um, Dylan for the uh, Maze Runner. You know, it's like he's he's in the. He's, He's in the there. mix. He's in the mix. He's in the mix. Thank you. So, but I, I and I, I, I'm, I'm sure they know how lucky they are. What I noticed when we sat down in John's office for like a little casual read through, nothing big, his emotions were right there. And he reminds me of that River Phoenix, DiCaprio, 
just sensitive right there. The emotions are flowing. It's honest. I thought, oh, man. And we just, we just loved each other equally. And, you know, it's... Go on. Yeah, oh, yeah, go. Oh, no, I'm just... No, I mean, you, you referenced, you know, River Phoenix, who you worked with uh, in the past. I'm wondering if you, at a certain point after having a, a career that stems back to, you know, the, the mid to late 80s, do you have a kind of barometer or a knowledge of like when you meet an actor because of so many that you've met before that this person's going to be great for the scene even before they start doing the scene? Can you tell right away like okay, this person has has a has a hand in how to perform, how to do this. I see it. It's going to be fine. I think so. I mean, I think with acting, it's pretty apparent right away. It's either that said je ne sais quoi, it's that something and I can but that's not to say I I don't want to have no contempt prior to investigation, so I'm not going to judge if the actor's like, what are you doing? You know, I'm going to give it a few rehearsals and then say, you know, we got to work something out here because it's not happening. But um, yeah. What do you think, uh, you, we, you mentioned how John changed your, uh, your child from a, a, a girl to a boy. What do you think that does to a sort of mainstream audience that's watching something like that? I, I brought this up with John, and I'll try to summarize this very quickly, which is that the scene in the, in the second episode, I believe, where your son gets examined, um, we all know that women post the sexual assault a lot of times get a rape kit of some kind, and it's something that we hear, and it's something that is within our culture. But for me, as a guy, for some reason, watching a guy get it, it hit me how invasive that is. And I always knew it was invasive, but suddenly it was even more invasive because I think I have that subconscious thing where it's like a guy's not supposed to have, that's not supposed to have to happen to, to a guy. What do you think, I mean, what do you think about that? That I mean, even me, I, I would consider myself pretty liberal, still has that kind of, uh, that experience, that immediate response to a scene like that and a decision to change genders. Yeah, you know, it's funny because John said the same thing. He said, you know, I'm a, I'm a black man. I thought I, I thought I was in touch with my biases, you know? Whoa, in the writer's room, they all came up against these biases. They're implicit biases. They're things we carry around. They're unconscious. We don't have control over them. And we need to get conscious of them. And I keep thinking that's one of the main culprits for so much not kind of changing. You know, and here you just had one, and I have them. You know, we, we, and that's why John is great, because he doesn't come up with answers. He presents those things that are like, Ooh, that my brain sort of hurts from that one. Like, what, what, what am I coming up against inside? You know, um, he presents a new layer of compassion that the audience gets to find, which is a pretty uh, Im incredible achievement. You know, very few can can do that. I agree. I mean, I think he's a genius. I do. What were you going to say? I was going to say you sort of led me to this. You've worked with a number of geniuses <laughs> over the course of your career, and it's something that I'm always curious about. Were you attracted to sort of finding great directors to work with, or did you find that directors, great directors were searching you out at a certain point and, and wanting to work with you, or was it sort of in tandem? You know, I, I almost felt like, you know when you're like a stray animal and you sort of find each other in this weird way? It sort of felt like we've sort of found each other, um, but I was looking for good directors, but I didn't really have that confidence to say, I want to work with you. You know, I didn't, I didn't have that. I wish I did, but um, maybe someday when I'm 90, I'll get there. But anyway, um, but I feel like that's the most important thing to me because in a way, like, who cares about the, if the role is great? If the director isn't, doesn't have the autonomy, the vision, who cares? I can do it in a scene study class. I can get my rocks off, like, with a monologue or something. I don't have to subject everyone else to my little acting exercise in a, in a shitty piece of movie. Do you know what I mean? That, that's kind of humble to refer to it as <laughs> that sometimes. I don't need to subject people to my dramatics on the, in front of them. Do you know what I'm them. saying, though? It's yeah. like, who needs it? There's enough out there. I'd rather see something where the whole is there as opposed to right. great performance, yawn for the rest of it, you know? And it's also the adventure of working with someone that has a vision. I mean, the kind of person who will take five to 40 million dollars for the purpose of their vision, vision has to be someone that's taking you on an, an adventure alone with their personality, I would imagine. Right. Or even 500,000 as Abel or 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, go, going back to when I brought this up in the green room, um, Shortcuts, it's, which is one of my favorite films of all time. It's a, it, I think if you see it at the right time in your life, it's a kind of life changer in how you mm. look at what movies can be. Mm. Um, and you're in that, you have these great scenes with Robert Downey Jr. where he's consistently sort of recreating the kind of abuse he wants to <laughs> inflict on you. What was it like uh, doing that movie with Robert Altman? He's apparently known for improvising, so is Robert Downey Jr. Were you guys improvising a lot and, and playing? 
Well, you know, it's funny how you said about can you tell with an actor when they've got the scene? It's like, can you tell with a director when they... Bob, it was so clear right away, this man, he knows what he's doing. Um, he's such, he was such a master, and I knew, I knew it was like an education. I knew to just soak up all of it because he was just, he just was so wise. And, you know, one of the things was is that, you know, he, he came up with a microphone system, you know, like a sound cart. Like, so all the actors were individually mic'd, which he came up with Nashville, which he wanted to come up with that so that we could overlap. Because a lot of times with film, you have to stop talking. You can't talk over each other, and we don't do that in life. And so Bob created us so that we can. So that extemporaneous feeling is all Bob created that. He created a special arm on the camera so that the camera was finding its own marks. We didn't have to worry about get to that X. So we could move where we wanted to move, talk how we wanted to talk. So right there, you're already comfortable, you know? Wow. That's, that's unbelievable. So you get to a Robert Altman set and it's, I mean, do you have to adjust to it as an actor no. or do you just suddenly feel kind of free? Well, you know what I felt like with Bob? This is what Bob did the first day with Shortcuts when I showed up. He, he was like, oh, you know, um, why don't you go in and I think Lily Tomlin and Tom Waits are doing something in there. Why don't you go on in there? And I was like, okay. Well, I went in and I went in the middle of an improv. And, I, and it's awkward, like, sometimes you don't know, like, what to do when you walk into an improv. Like, should you join in? Do you just stay who you are? It's very awkward. So I just kind of sort of joined in. Well, then I came out and I saw Bob had the ear, ear um, headphones on and he knew exactly what he was doing. He sent me in there on purpose. He wanted to hear what was happening. But he had this thing like, oh, why don't you, uh, sort of like he would create this party and right. say, come here, you're all invited. But he knew exactly... In sort of tricking you into, into sort of thinking that it's your idea to do something or, or that it's just a casual, do it or don't do it. it. Exactly. You know? But it's benign. It wasn't malevolent. It wasn't like, I'm going to pull strings. It wasn't like that. It, was, it just makes everybody comfortable. Exactly. And then and, you relax. And, and, and you got to do scenes with uh, Lily Tomlin and, and Tom Waits, which oh, I can't imagine hello. were anything but... I mean, Incredible. Lily Tomlin, she was my idol when I was little, Ernestine, and all those, those characters she had. Oh, my was God. Was Lily Tomlin your idol? Because I oh. feel like, because of your names, <laughs> people well, always will go, Lily Taylor, Lily Tomlin. Okay. Well, they don't know. I mean, that Ernestine album, I mean, I had, I mean, because I'm almost 50, so we had record players and albums. So, yeah. and I just, I just, list, I ate her up. I loved her. Really? Yeah, so I never told her, but. I, oh, I, you kept it cool? <laughs> <laughs> is there ever is there ever been an actor because there's been so many directors and actors that you were around that you did that you didn't keep it cool? For instance, I worked with Madonna, and I actually have a story because my sister danced with her, and I actually met her when I was in fifth grade at University of Michigan. I'm not going to tell her. How many people have told her? Guess what? I knew you went. I'm connected to I'm you connected somehow. To you. So I'm one we, of the maybe thousand we million. can be more friends. I just said hi. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm not going to bore. Her. I know the connection. She doesn't have to know the connection. So you've never you've never lost your cool with with anybody that you work with. I've probably lost my cool, but I haven't I haven't <laughs> I haven't annoyed them. Hopefully. <laughs> um, and you mentioned a, a, another director that that I love, Abel. You said Ferrara. Abel. Five, was was the addiction with Christopher Walken and Annabelle Sior? Was that five hundred thousand dollars? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's a it's this incredible New York movie uh, that's black and white, and and it's yeah, I guess it's a very low budget, but it's this it's this wild, and if you don't know who Abel Ferrara is, I recommend all of you journeymen out there to go and indulge yeah. and watch uh, and The plus, Addiction and, and plus Bad it's Lieutenant. really fun for just a New York tour, like yeah. Annie Hall. Any of these great New York movies are fun because these things that aren't here anymore because the city's changing, you get to see things um, that just aren't there anymore. So are, you a, are you a lifelong New Yorker or are you L.A. I, too? I came here in 88. Oh, so I, I, I mean, I guess you're 13 years and you're an official New Yorker, so I'm past that. I'm from Chicago, but I came But you've maintained New York rather than oh, L.A.? Oh, God, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. So. No, no. All the way, yeah. What made you stay in New York rather oh, than L.A.? Oh, I love... I was never a choice. I try to be positive. Like, it's not that I don't like a L.A. I just love New York. That's my thing. But, I mean, I love theater. It was never of a question. I just love this city. I mean, it's changing a lot. I'm trying to not be bitter and adapt, <laughs> adapt, um, be flexible, but, um, um, but I still love the city and the spirit is still really strong. Mm -hmm. Did you ever find that staying in New York affected your career in any mm -hmm. way? Really? Yeah. Oh, sure. Right when I moved here in 88, everyone was moving to LA. I thought, oh, great, the exodus and I'm coming here. And then it was like, oh no, there's no films. You didn't know that? I'm like, oh really? But I stuck around and that's when the independence happened. Yeah. Because we were all, everyone had moved to LA and we were all like, shit. And we're like, well, we want to do something. We have $10, let's go for it. 
We did it. And that's true. The 90s was the, I mean, what many people refer to as the heyday of independent exactly. film. And I wonder if it was because so few Hollywood movies were shooting in New York at that time. Right, and the crews, a lot of it. the crews had left, so they were, a lot of the actors had left. So it was just like, well, we're all still here. Let's do something, because we have to create something, because we're artists, you know? Wow. So what did, what did that feel like? What was it like the around best. here? Oh, I love it. And it's not like I'm, uh, you know, morbid or, you know, Gloria Swanson with the old days. You know, I'm not like that. Yeah. But it was a great time because, because we, we, there were no rules. Um, the directors weren't being told what to do. They had freedom. No one was giving them a list of, well, you have to cast yeah. X, Y, Z, you know. Um, we were doing it on the fly. No one said, don't pick up an Apple box or put that light down or whatever. We all were doing it together, and it was just... For me, that's what it's about. I just, the collaboration thing I'd mentioned, just yeah. us all being there together, I just love that spirit. And now you get that, uh, it sounds like, with, with John on totally. American Crime, but do you miss a certain element? Because it seems like a, you know, a fair amount of your, your recent works, The Conjuring, a fair amount of television. Do I, you miss... I felt that on The Conjuring. I felt really? that spirit. Because in a way, it doesn't matter if, what the money is. If the director has freedom and the producers are cool and nobody's interfering, then you've got a great you've got a great set. And if the director is one of those like, let's get the shot, come on, we gotta go. Okay, yeah, just everybody. Nobody's like, there's no lines of demarcation because we're all we're all creating together. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever experienced the situation where producers are interfering and all that stuff? Oh, what what's that awful. like? What happens? It's death. It's death. It's corporate. It's just like, oh, it's like it's just like when the body has like a heart clog or the arteries aren't flowing or it's like it's just like, oh, this isn't very good for creating things. Yeah, you're like, when is this show? This is, when whoa, is this over? What, we, uh, what, what set up are with 35 and 36 setups? And, oh, God, I'm falling asleep. <laughs> what's the, what's the, oh, I'm curious, I mean, not in regards to producers interfering or anything like that, but what would you say the toughest project you've ever had is that you've ever worked on? Oh, boy. Oh, Jesus. Um, Mystic Pizza. No, it's just kidding. <laughs> well, it had its own little thing, but it was sure. fun because I was innocent. It was my first one. But there was times when I was the director, I was like, he was confusing me, and I just told him to just not say anything because it was just <laughs> <laughs> just shut up. Let just, me do just it. Just stop. You're just like just stop. What is the thing that they say that that's confusing you? Is that when a director is kind of like when they don't oh, know let's how to talk direct. about your backstory and your emotions and this, this, and that, rather than being like just walk over here and it's when they sort of say say it like say it like whoa that scared me. It's like whoa 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 whoa. You just line readings are really bad to give to an yeah. actor, or when they say like. Uh, you know, some sort of negative action, like, use your womanly wiles. It's like, how do you do, what is that? What is that exactly? I mean, I can try to manipulate somebody, but women, what are you talking about? Womanly wiles? Womanly wiles. I'm 19, by the way, dude. Like, come on, give me a break. Well, you're I'm like, like a woman, girl. Womanly, womanly wiles. wiles. Give okay, me a second. Got it. Got it. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but the worst one, um, Jesus. Or most, or most difficult, not necessarily the worst, but like a, a really difficult project. Well, um, well, something called Bright Angel. I call it Battered Angel, so that will give you an idea. <laughs> Let's put it this way. I was fired, and then they couldn't, they couldn't afford to reshoot, so I had to stay. That's not fun when they want to fire you and having to, like, I'm still here. Why were, why were you fired? Do you remember Hemdale? It was this crazy company. Yes, from, yeah. they, He was crazy. Yeah. And I don't know. He didn't like me, or he didn't, I don't know. He's just like, get her out of here. That's crazy. I know. You're like a director. You're, I mean, but you're, it's crazy because you're like a director's dream. I mean, Thank so you. many wonderful directors cast you, and you always pull off really beautiful performances. Thank you. It seems crazy. Like, when I hear from an actor that, like, I'm worried that I'm getting fired, sometimes when I hear an actor say that, I'm like, well, yeah. yeah well, it's you quite should possible be, actually. that you, you right, go back to modeling. Like, it's fine. Like, maybe it's not working out. Uh, but going back to uh, American crime, yes. uh, do you feel like. This is kind of working with John Ridley is kind of like a huge step for you and like a one of the one of the big roles of your career. Well, I Can mean, you even quantify it that way. Well, at all sure, no. I mean, for me, it sort of feels like when I'm when I'm, uh, let's say, uh, working my chops, you know. And I haven't gotten to, I've got to do it in theater. I've gotten to do it here and there, but I haven't really gotten to do it for a while. So he's given me this opportunity to like to work the way I want to work. This is how I want to be working. Like, every actor does, though. Who doesn't? You know, but I do, because I love working. And um, so he's given me a great thing. Because, you know, as the business changes, it's like I've been around a while, careers ebb and flow, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so what this does is just gets you a little bit more energy around you. So you walk into a room and you're like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we will think about you for this. Yeah. 
Well, and you watch the way that he shoots these scenes, you know, and uh, as someone who pays attention to movies, you can see the number of setups, and you're, you're thinking to yourself, this is for actors. He's directing this for the actors. He's got maybe two cameras trained at one time, and he's got a close-up here, a close-up here, and maybe there's a wide to establish this stuff, but he's really concerned about the energy of the actors in this scene and how to get them through it and how to make sure he gets the most realistic portrayal possible, which must be so comforting as an it actor is, to walk and, into. And he's really... He's concerned with the actors and the acting and the feeling because that's what's going to transmit to the audience. So he really cares about the audience, yeah. you know, and and he really believes it's with the f actors' faces. That's why there's so much, you know, or on who the scene is about. You'll notice he doesn't bother cutting to other people if the scene's about, which I think is, why waste the time? Oh, I love how in this season he has people who are off camera's voices. Uh, like Charlie uh, sort of Brown? Off mic. Partic particularly the, the, the grown ups are sometimes wah, 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 yeah. you know? It's great. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can you can you can see how much uh, he cares about the actors in these scenes just as just by how sort of little coverage he 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 focuses on or, or you know most television shows it's like we got a wide we got a close up close up a second close up then we're pushed in now we're zooming in and you can imagine an actor sitting there being like we got to do this again well, I can and imagine again. me I can't stand it I mean and I'm like you know the scene actually I don't know how the scene has any life in it. By the time we're done with this damn thing, and why did we do all these things? Do we really need all this, guys? What are we doing? Well, with cutting, you can, you know, unfortunately add that life. It just makes it you harder can add for the actor. it, but sort of. But then there's that mercurial sort of thing oh, that I agree. can happen, right? And yeah. I know you do. I know yeah. that's what you. But but some of these other people are like, oh, I don't know about that mercurial thing. It doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we have to go to okay. uh, audience uh, questions. Anyone have any questions? Hi, Lily. I'm a big fan of the show. Um, the first season, Felicity Huffman played a protective mother, and this season, you playing a protective mo mother. Did you ask her for any advice about the transition, and um, what did you guys talk about? Did I ask Felicity for advice? Uh, yes. Like how to transition? Protective mom to protective, protective mom. mom. Stuff? Yeah. Um, not really, um, because we're sort of different protective moms, you know, and I think that the way that character dealt with things Mine's the MO's a little different, but we we talked and we like each other a lot and shared things. But um, I didn't really need to talk to her about her parenting for that episode, that season. You're you're a parent. Do you ever think about your parenting when you're doing the show or anything like that? Does that ever come into your head? Oh yeah, I mean, and are you think are you talking specifically about like the content about thinking about my kid with? The content of this, or just like, what do you mean? Not necessarily the content and your kid, but I mean, maybe that's it. I would think of it more as in like, you're playing this character who parents this way. Yeah. I parent another way. How do I, I better right. make sure I don't do that? I, exactly. And that's what I say to the character. I said, I've got another idea of how you should be doing this, but you're doing it this way, and I'll let you do what you're doing. Right. But I would actually, not a good idea. <laughs> you're going to have some pushback. <laughs> uh, next question. Hi, Lily. Um, I'm a huge fan of The Conjuring. I think your performance was spectacular. Um, but when you were doing your research for the role, were you reading through the Warren files? Like, how much research did you do on them, and what prepared you for the role? You know, I didn't need to do much on that um, because it wouldn't. Sometimes, as an actor, you really have to decide what that balance of what you need and what you don't. And sometimes there can be too much baggage. And that would have been um, baggage for me. So what I really needed to look at was, unfortunately, was exorcisms, um, which I don't recommend to anybody. It's awful. Real ones. And believe me, they're out there on YouTube, and they, they're awful. And then I had to learn how to scream. Those were the two things I had to work on. You, uh, you just set up my, my evening tonight. Don't do my it, baby. YouTube exorcism viewing. If you do, have your, have, your, have your girlfriend with a rope holding you into that <laughs> because it's, it's scary. Yeah. Yeah, be, wow. do, do, do be careful. How many did you? How many did you watch? How many did you find? About five, but That's they were good. heavy. Well, they're enough. That was enough. But then I realized each one they were making these particular sounds because you're in like another world. You're like in an animal world. So, and then I found this woman who teaches these grun, not grunge. Who are those people that yell that music that where they just yell? She teaches them how to yell this because they they were losing their voices. So they found this woman who teaches you how to yell. And then I got her DVDs or CDs. And then I learned how to yell. So you did a lot of research. I did, I did research, but just not with the Warrens. <laughs> <laughs> That's un unbelievable. Did watching exorcisms on YouTube affect like any sort of faith that you may have had or belief in the in the spiritual? No, ghost? it's just a sort of like get a psychotherapist, <laughs> get the priest out of there. They need meds. Yes. Uh, next question. Hi, Lily. Hi. So I was wondering if there's any cases or issues today that you might think would be a good topic to hit on future American crime seasons. 
Ooh, dare I, dare I venture into John Ridley's territory? Um, you know what? It's like, I kind of don't even have to think about it because I know he's going to do it. And what I like to do is sort of, like, for instance, he told me what it was about, and I was like, hey, did you read Missoula by John Krakauer? And he's like, great. And so then we work together. I like sort of like, you come up with the idea, I'm going to build on it. That's what I like to do. I don't like to come up with ideas. I think you should do campaign finance law on the next one just after the election. Yeah. Just an idea. Good one. Good one. <laughs> Throw that to John. Okay. Uh, next question. Good afternoon. Um, I feel like crime dramas as, as, a, as a genre, you pretty much hit on the same points but then you see something like The Wire and it's so authentic that you feel like you never have to see another crime drama. But then you see something like Top Boy, for example, where you get hit in those same sort of authentic lines, but it's set in a different region and it's kind of shot like an art house drama. And I haven't seen American Crime yet, but I was here when John was here and it completely sold me on it. What is it about crime dramas that even though they're hitting these same points time and time again, you're still entertained and it's still something amazing to watch. And do you also have a favorite crime drama? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we're seeing with like uh, uh, the making of a murderer, law and order. I mean, we like crime. I think we like, I think crime has so many different things. It has the human, human, uh, not spirit, but like uh, psychology. It has justice. It has, you know, the OJ stuff's coming up, the TV show, and then the documentary. I hear the documentary is fantastic. That's going to have all that stuff that I think we love, you know? Um, I, I, I can see why Law and Order is addicting, and I think it's comforting in a way, because it's like Scooby-Doo. You kind of know they're going to hit that point, they're going to hit that point. That's exactly what it is. You know, it's sort of like, and it's great, it's comforting, but for me, like, I give me The Staircase or Murder on a Sunday Morning, that fantastic French director, or, uh, like, I love, I love those things, but I like them in a documentary, and I really like when um, it's, it's... I like seeing real people go through this and I think that's why John's amazing because he's, we're, he's trying to get as honest with people as possible as opposed to like I heard somebody say about law and order like a civilian like a regular person like well no no that's not how people react because I saw in law, law and order that actually the victim reacts like X and it's like Jesus you know this is we really are teaching each other how to feel really through yeah. the storytelling and the more we get out this sort of false narrative of how human beings react to situations, it's not doing us any service at all as human beings. I'm specifically uh, blown away by the reaction to SVU and that SVU has gone on so long. Specif because SVU is about se sexual victims and it always wraps up, like you said, like Scooby-Doo, so you have the most grotesque, the most morbid versions of crime in, in this country that are then wrapped up into a nice little, neat little package so it's swallowed. And I was just on one of them. Very strange. It is, and I just did one, as every New York actor does. Oh, yeah, absolutely, We of all course. have to, and I had to be part of that gang. When you have, like, a couple weeks off, do you send Law & Order, like, yeah, a, yeah. A, hey, like, guys, I'm in the city for a couple weeks? Yeah, <laughs> rent, rent's due. Um, um, and it was, thank God mine wasn't as grotesque, but, you know, my daughter was missing and, you know, wasn't pretty. But, yeah, I was like, you know, let's wrap this puppy up. We're going to, you know how this goes, <laughs> But I love I love SVU. I don't want to put out a bad thing. No, no, Mariska no. Hardigay. I've watched my fair share. Okay. Yeah, we uh, all have. Yeah. Uh, Lily, thank you so much for thank being you. here. It's an absolute honor to talk to you. American Crime, guys. Tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, Wednesdays at 10. Best show on television. Thank you so much.